But we still have some more Hearthstone to play because we got to finish the regular season out, which means we're headed into match number five, Boston taking on Silvername in this one. Both these players looking to have that finish on their season that they would have liked to have er early on. You know, it's not going to be everyone's season. That's the nature of competition here. Yeah. And so now for Boston and Silvername, it's about pulling some things together and making sure you cap it off with a win. There's still prize money at stake and there's still pride on the line. Yeah, and there's still just information, experience, experimentation to be had going into season two, where season two is going to be a lot more cutthroat. Some of these players that we're getting into now who aren't competing for that top three are going to be trying to stave off that bottom one. And if you are bottom one next season, you are going to be relegated. If you're Tice, if you're Parble, if you're anyone that's in that position, that's what's going to happen to you. So the players who find themselves towards the bottom two or three positions within their divisions have to do everything they can with these last couple of games to make sure they're in the best position uh, next, next season in terms of understanding how the meta works, sharpening up their play, understanding players' habits, all of these things to make sure that they can hit the ground running in season two. Indeed. And that brings us now to the deck list and the matchup that's going to be taking place here, uh, which we can take a look at here in just a second. If you're looking at Boston's deck, that means you're looking at a Cyclone Mage deck. And uh, he has tended to bring uh, like the, the Twilight Drake or something in the main deck that tries to make a little bit of that impact. But uh, his secondary deck, very different than the Warrior approach that, uh, that Hunter Ace had in that one, just more of the traditional top end stuff uh, that's put in there. And the tertiary deck, some of that anti-aggro package with uh, the two halftime scavengers, half scavengers, a Rabble Bouncer and a Frostbolt. Yeah, and we are back into Mage versus Rogue Country, so a lot of this is treading over old ground, but if you haven't been with us over a long time, uh, especially during day one, where this was essentially the matchup of the day throughout the uh, the vast majority of what we had. Um, personally, I'm a big fan of Frostbolts coming in over everything else. Most players tend to put Halftime Scavenger as their number one card on the list and then build around that when it comes to their tertiary anti-rogue deck. And Bosden, no different. Two Scavengers in there at first port of call and then Frostbolt and Rebel Bouncer coming. Indeed, and so Silver Name's deck, uh, I have loved his choices in the last couple of weeks. I think it's looked much better than his yeah. uh, beginning and middle the of the season. The good decks. The good decks. Yeah. We're, I mean, you're playing You're playing for competition here. You have to compete. And if that means you got to bring good decks, so be it. Uh, I like what he's done here this week. He's just brought Rogue that we have seen become uh, a staple of, of the metagame. It, there's no question about it. This is one of the most powerful decks that's out there. And for Silver Name, I know he's got the potential to pilot these decks. I'm so glad that he's brought him towards the end of the season to show everyone that he can compete once he's got the right cards. Yeah, I think he's played great. I think he's just had some wacky ideas about what the right decks were because, you know, we actually spoke to him and he said, you know, I'm bringing these decks because I think it's correct to bring these decks. I think these are the decks that give me the best chance of winning. I'm not just bringing like a lazy deck or an ABC deck so I don't have to think or I don't have to try. I think this is the right deck to bring. He thought that was the case for Mech Hunter. He thought that was the case for Token Druid. Um, I don't know what changed. I don't know whether overwhelming weight of, uh, you know, contrary opinion overwhelmed him in the end. And he started to switch away more to the, the same kind of stuff that everyone else was doing. But his, he has improved his record significantly since then. You know, I think there's something to speak about well with done. just expertise on it as well. I, I think that uh, right now of uh, the top three decks that Rogue and Mage are two of the harder decks that we've really seen in Hearthstone. These current ones that you're watching right now. And so I think when you take that into account in the grand scheme of things, uh, stuff like, like Token Druid definitely offers you a lot more um, forgiveness in some of the plays that you make. Your power plays are quite obvious and straightforward, and it's about the timing and when you pick those decks that really matters. And uh, one of the references I'll, I'll use is that is um, so at the Masters options. Tour in Las Vegas. Uh, Papa Jason brought Token Druid to the tournament, and he played it pretty fantastically. He was patient at the right times. He was aggressive at the right times. And there were so many warriors at that tournament that he was able, to, I think, to, to get an edge. You know, people oftentimes look at Token Druid and wait a minute, does this lose a warrior? And the answer is not, not really. really. Yeah. It's pretty good against Warrior. You know, historically, it's been thought to be the case. It's just not right now. And he had a wonderful uh, record. I believe he finished 9-3 and three, uh, at the Masters Tour with uh, with Token Druid in that one. It was the right call at the right time. And I think that was a large part of, of where uh, Silvername was bringing those decks. Over time, he probably got some more experience with Mage and with Rogue and the like and decided to start bringing those as well. I wonder. But we are here now. It's Rogue versus Mage. It feels like we've just had a nice little vacation from Rogue versus Mage, and now we've come flying back to it towards the end. Yeah. Absence oh, makes the heart grow fonder. Is that the expression? Um, that sounds right. I've never heard that before, but it sounds like it's a saying. Pretty sure it's a thing. A lot of things you say sound like a saying, though. 
thank you? Yes. Okay. <laughs> that that means you speak eloquently and and thoughtfully. Yes. When things aren't sayings, that's probably because they're not very eloquently thought out. Good. For instance, most of the stuff I say. I wonder. How how different would the world be if like all of the great iconic literature was l written by loud, brash Americans? By me? Yeah. I'm not gonna write that. <laughs> okay. So many options. I, if I could make the decision to write it, like if I could just choose to write it, yeah, sure. I'm just curious as to what like phrases would enter the common tongue if it wasn't just random stuff William Shakespeare came up with. It was stuff that you and TJ came up with in the middle of a car. I was about to say, see also uh, Bahamas 2017, yeah. 2016. Uh, so sort of an aim, managed to get some pressure going here. He had a bit of a think tank over what he wanted to develop, but Blink Fox just seemed to make the most sense. Bosdom, for his part, hasn't really been able to get anything be, uh, going early on, but he has been on coin, and he does have Arcane Intellect in hand. What he does have do decent responsive cards as well to make sure he's not getting beaten up too quickly. So I think he's in a pretty stable position so far in this game, but there is the X factor of that Edwin Van Cleef sooner rather than later that can change things very rapidly. Opts not for the Mana Cyclone. I, I was curious about the Edwin last turn for Silver Name because it looked like he was contemplating uh, what the double shadow step meant for the Edwin Van Cleef. Whether he wanted to just like Edwin step this turn, like last turn maybe. Or Edwin, hope it lives, and then attack step, sure. Edwin step, and then if you have like a two drop or something, you get to play that and go. So many. Like I'm options. wondering if he had Evil Cable Rat in hand at that time, would that have changed anything? Because large Edwins are one of the best ways to beat mages. I mean, you just make a big enough Edwin, it'll beat anything. Yeah, sure will. I think, you know, I've, I've made this point several times, but huge Edwin early means that any freezes that the mage does have in hand just start getting sucked out so quicker. So, so quicker, so much quicker. Right after a conversation about how well I spoke as well. It's so perfect. Um, but yeah, huge Edwin comes down early. Suddenly, rare frosts have to start getting used immediately. Frost Novas have to start getting used immediately because the alternative is to use one of your best cards and three mana to turn a 6-6 six, six into two three drops, which is often not even a positive situation for you. Yeah, that's just about the same. Yeah. And sometimes a lot worse. Yeah. Sometimes they just get Mukla questing adventurer, and then you're sad. Or just 3-3 three, three, and 3-3, three, three, and you're like, oh, this didn't do anything. Mm. It made your sea giant cost one less. Hey, upside. Yeah. Not really. It's just like a bad wild growth, <laughs> which is really bad. <laughs> Nowadays, anyway. It's a lot like a bad wild Back growth. in my day, wild growth was a lot cheaper than it is now. <laughs> what to do? What to do? One of my earliest interactions with That's Admirable was at a Gfinity tournament in the UK. Which he came to commentate, and I was there as a player. Because uh, believe it or not, I used to be pretty good at this game. Um, I'd qualified for the tournament. There's a bunch of invites there, Firebat, etc. It was the first huge tournament in the UK. First time for me meeting a bunch of these people, including Admirable. My first interaction with Admirable is him standing up in these theater seats, which it was in a uh, disused cinema, essentially. Standing up at the back of these theater seats and shouting at the cinema screen that was broadcasting the game about how someone was dumb for keeping a second copy of Wild Growth in their hand. And then for the course of the game, continued to shout at the screen about how dumb it was. I'm going to amend this because you partially remember it correctly. The shouting thing happened. The thing that didn't happen was Wild Growth. It was Innervate. And everyone was debating about the Innervate because it was against you a control matchup. You might be right. And yeah, Nyria, yeah. who yes. I considered at the time the best player in the world, agreed with me. Now, they got the reward of drawing a Dr. Boom after keeping two Innervates, but they still almost lost that game because they had two Innervates instead of having Wild Growth instead. You want Innervates for Force of Nature Savage Wars at the end of the game, not for the Dr. Boobs early. Big Game Hunter cost three men back then and they played two of them. I hope you like my invention. <sighs> you are good correct, sir. It was Innervate. I stand corrected. The good old days. The shouting thing is definitely true. The spirit yeah, of the story too. still stands. <laughs> Exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> I had to smash my button to prevent from flapping hysterically into the microphone at the start of that. 
In the meantime, Boston has gone for a delayed situation to try to buy himself some time because he simply just doesn't have the right tools to fight with right now. And as you can see, Silvername has just compounded the issue. Play more stuff and keep attacking. You kind of saw the dynamic happen to do? as I laid it out. What Edwin came do? down, Boston was forced to react. You just can't let that Edwin keep attacking every turn. But the, the more he commits to not letting it attack, the less resources he has in hand, the, later, the less he has an ability to freeze a big board later on to create a swing turn uh, with a sea giant or even a mountain giant. And as we've mentioned mm. several times, this deck is all about those swing turns. I will show you. There it is again. Oh, I really want to play the Mana Cyclone. It's so important, though. That's the second one. You have a Flame Strike, you have a Sea Giant. Something tells me that I want to play the Cyclone. Boston wants more. I can't blame him. I'm, you know, I'm looking at a, a couple turns set up here where he's able to get some headway on board, maybe make some freezes, and look for a Sea Giant and a Flame Strike in the same turn. Ooh. All right, I like where your head's at. It's ambitious, but I like I it. Wonder. I mean, when Cyclone gives you Flame Strikes, make, make Flame, flame strike, strike Aid. aid? Yeah. yeah. Aid your ability to get back into the game Ayo! with a Sea Giant. <laughs> I can imagine Flame Strikes Aid. Just, it's just a Flame Strike with Twin Spell. <laughs> So many options. Like the forest aid. Like the forest aid. Yeah. What's the mage equivalent of a forest? Like the druid lives in the forest. Where does the mage? Galaran, I guess. You're talking to the wrong person now. We get Nimsh or Raven or somebody on the phone. Dalaran aid. Oh, that's the name of it. Welcome to Dalaran. <laughs> Mountain Giant, much more safe in game number one to play. There is a single copy of Sap in, uh, in Silver Name's deck. It's games two and three where plopping Mountain Giants becomes much more difficult. Yeah. Also, however, a newly introduced secret this turn from uh, Silver Name hmm. that Boston has to pay serious heed oh, to. Oh, hang on. If you evocation, though, and it's counterspell, what ends up happening is your Mountain Giant doesn't come down this turn. Well, what did you want to do to begin with? You'd want a Mountain Giant Frost Nova turn, or? Kinda, yeah. Okay, so if, like your Mountain Giant, even if it's Mirror Entity, you end up Frost Novaing the Mountain Giant anyway, but they do still have a Mountain Giant in that position. It's true, and they have a random card, and you know, Vendettas are there. I mean, you can't get easily tempoed out that way. I guess that's a good point. I mean, he's still playing towards the, uh, the Flame Strike turn. Yeah. So, looking back, it's either Banana Baboon and Frost Nova, or it's Kona Cold and something. Does Mana Cyclone count spells that have been countered? It does not. Nope. That's the first time I've experienced that. The Kona Cold here also is, uh, I think, quite important because it incentivizes Silver Name, obviously, to push into the board. And it also weakens it to the point where it's the dying the flame strike. Yeah, the one damage on the Edwin was key. I was wondering whether it was going to be a ping that turn. Like, he could still so just do, like, giant options. ping if he wanted to. Um, but he does end up taking a lot of damage in that scenario. Push past the giant, doesn't get a swing turn out of his giant. So Cone of Cold just prevent the damage again by a ton of time. Give himself a flame strike clear on the following turn, and that flame strike clear is looking rather juicy. It's not so bad for Silver Name because he does get a lot of gas out of this shark before it ends up getting blown up. But I think also Boston will be relatively happy that he gets an extra spirit of the shark out of the equation in setting up this flame strike. Yeah, I think you're I think you're pretty okay with this. That makes you a little bit unhappy, and as you can see the the look from Boston going, well, I guess I lose my tutu now in addition to that. So that tells me maybe you're interested in something else. Like now the mountain giant frost nova looks even better, right? 
just don't want to. You just don't want the shark to happen because kobold lackeys will just kill your mountain giant. At that point. yeah, exactly. I'm kind of. I'm curious about that though. Like, I wonder if like mountain giant frost nova there yields silver name playing the rest of his hand, Nothing. and then you flame strike. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're down a giant, and they're down some lackeys that they generated, and I kind of know which side of that equation I want to be on. I'm looking at it two ways. Number one, can I run them out of stuff? Which, you know, obviously you're looking at spell lackeys also being able to take care of the giant as well. That's an issue. Uh, the number two, though, is that I feel like if this game keeps going long, it's pretty Boston favored. Yeah. So I guess either way you land on holding the mountain giant? Okay. Everything coming up, Elias. Good old Elias Elias. A very few occasions <laughs> where you're sad to see sorcerer's apprentices. I, I am not sad to see these. No? Nope. Just because they're good or because you want to do things with them this turn? I'm thinking next turn. No good. Then fine. I was simply referring to their usage this turn. Oh. Well, what's good this turn? Boston's one of the players this week that did not bring Luna's Pocket Galaxy. It was a really good Luna's Pocket Galaxy turn. It's about as low pressure as you're going to get. Yeah, I'm curious, actually. Like a Twilight Drake, maybe? Actually, was it? If you just ripped Luna's there, you just died at Leroy, right? Oh, you're standing on Waggle Pick, yeah. Yeah. Largely irrelevant anyway, because as mentioned, Bosdom was one of the few people to really speak out against uh, Luna's Pocket Galaxy. Although Kalento actually came down on that side as well during his interview, hey, I'd have to say. Like my yeah, it, his was, I think, uh, an auxiliary plan where he's like, I could bring all this stuff and it changes the game. Yeah. It definitely is a lot worse when, you know, your opponent's just blowing up your stuff when it gets played. Right. And they're pressuring you at the same time. my invention. A lot of cards being drawn for Silver Name now. But what pressure do you get to add? Like you really want to use these kobolds to finish the that game. You don't want to just deal the damage and have them in play because they're just one ones that are making your opponent's sea giants significantly cheaper. Um, and they tend to play into a large range of uh, random spells that your opponent can generate as well. Although I think Bosden might just be out of those at this point from Silvername's perspective. Yeah, he just can't draw a Conjurer's Calling, it feels like. My goodness. Boston, you're like two-thirds to the deck. The future is ours. Someday I'll be just like you. The tools of creation. Okay, magic trick is still available for random stuff as well. Yowzers. Behold the tools of creation. Still not there. If Khadgar comes down, he can rip the Tome of Intellect and then still play a Conjurer's Calling on the following turn thinking for a about, big three drop board. I'm thinking about the Sorcerer's Apprentice as well. Ah. Okay. So Frost Nova into Cadgar. Prompts uh, Silver Name to want to respond to it. Behold the tools of creation. Also considering Cadgar images now. Fills up your board. Does. No space for the Sea Giant afterward. We must band together, united for Dalaran. However. The onus of pushing is on Silver Name right now, not on, not on Boston. Yep. The and there's a Conjurer's Calling. My goodness, that took a long time. Yeah, I mean, we might not even need it at this juncture. Like the game's gone so long, and he's gathered such a big hand of giants. It's like Silver Name's got to find a way to kill through this. And I'm looking at a second Frost Nova in hand. I wonder. I'm looking at a pair of sea giants that right now, they don't need no Luna's Pocket Galaxy to cost zero. They're just ready to go. Oh, 
Silvername does have everything he needs to be able to take care of the board objective minions, but it's not where he would ideally have wanted this damage to go this game. I've mentioned multiple times that Cobalt Lackeys and Backstabs when playing against Rogue are very valuable for this reason. Um, but not so much when you are staring at a hand that's kind of just outright damage and that's your only plan. In that case, you want to be shipping all of that damage face. Third Frost Nova. Giant, giant, giant Frost Nova. And you get to play around Betrayal in every sense of the word. Giant right, giant left, giant middle. Yep. Just as it should be. I think there was an America's game between Zalay and Purple mm. where some like weird positioning happened and TJ and Frodan spent like 30 to 45 seconds trying to work out what the positioning was about. It was literally just Zalay making it symmetrical to make Purple laugh. <laughs> that was the only reason it happened, I swear. I swear it was the only reason. What to do, what to do. Step one complete. Complete? Nope. Time runs out on me. Giant left. Giant right. Ooh, Banana, Banana man middle. All right. Okay. Ah, he's found damage. That's what the difference is. Why is this found damage? 19. Wait a minute. What? I just assumed if he was going to play bananas and suit him up and attack that he had found some lethal opportunity here. Well, it definitely wasn't a lethal setup. I'm going to ration out his threats a bit longer. He knows he has another Frost Nova to go. But why? Well, I mean, some Miracle World where he exposes all three Giants to the board that turn and they all somehow get taken down. And then he has a dead Conjurer's Calling and very few cards I left in the Somehow is the variable that I I'm feeling to connect. what do you want from me? What's up? This is your, this is your job! <laughs> what do you mean? <laughs> it's partially my job, too. But that's why I'm questioning it. I would have snapped the three giants that time. What to do? What to do? Because now Boston finds himself in a position where there's like giant conjurer's calling Frost Nova is too expensive, for example. So now his most aggressive plays are just too restrictive. So eight face Conjurer's calling then, then Conjurer's what calling again, do. and then Frost Nova. To do. Is that still twin spell? It is, right? He hasn't used it yet. <laughs> eh. runs out on me. Never mind. <laughs> Frozen to death. Hmm. Yeah, well, step one definitely seems like sapping that death wing. That's a card that doesn't seem like it's coming into play again anytime soon. Step two, swing in a mirror image. So many options. I kind of like this. I think from Silvername's perspective, where he doesn't necessarily know there are more Frost Novas to come because yeah. two have been randomly generated to this point. 
I think he's well within his rights to expect that he can just send 1-1s one and, you know, 3-3s three into these 0-2s to clear them out of the board and then fully connect maximum damage to face and actually have uh, more control over what he wants to bounce back in that situation as well. And it just so happens that there are more Frost Novas and Silvername is going to, going to be very upset about it. In 3, 2, 1. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that about does it. Yeah, don't don't blame me for that one. Oh, great! The Arcano Sword back in hand. Perfect. Everything's just going wonderfully this game. Yeah, and I'm. Um, you know, we we like to make fun of you know players making salty expressions or whatever on camera, but I'm, I'm actually kind of with Silver Name on that one. That was yes. a proper tilter. Um, I feel like those extra Frost Novas potentially dug Boston out of some situations of his own creation. Even. Um. I was going to go much harsher than that. I, I had no idea what happened in the middle of that game. Giant, giant, giant Frost Nova. The game ends. What are we doing there? <laughs> this gesture it's, is essential. It's like seven that. turns afterwards. Like, yeah. beat them up. They have nothing left. Yeah. They're done. It's over. They're dead. I love how your level of belligerence and your level of hand movement are directly correlated. <laughs> going on. Giant, giant, giant. The game ends. Correlation is causation. <laughs> Scientists always say that. I'm definitely not being facetious at all whatsoever. I've never done that before. I am weirded out by the non-giants there. Either way, uh, we're going to have to go to a quick break and come back for game number two, where both of them have stuff they're bringing in. Boston bringing in some anti-acro package, where Silvername looking to get a bit more aggressive and have some removal that perhaps then Boston should fear. Be right back with game two of match five. I'm Mazahi Dolezlam. I go by Muzzy in game. My username, as you know, my first name is Mazahido. It's kind of difficult to say for some people, and every time someone calls you, you know, they're gonna have to say, "Hey, Mazahido." You know, that's that's long, and you don't want to say that. My friend gave me a nickname, you know, like, "Hey, Muzz, Hey, Muzzy." So I sort of just took that, and you know, the name's Muzzy. I took a look at the list of players. Some of them have been more focused on streaming, I would say, in these past few years. I've participated at the highest levels of competition that they might not have appeared in. I'm the player to beat in my group, for sure. The thing that I most look forward to about competing in Grand Masters is the thrill of competition. It's really why I play Hearthstone. It's what I've enjoyed doing for the past three, four years, and it's what I'll continue to enjoy doing, hopefully. I think Hearthstone Instinct is definitely my, my greatest skill set. I think that if I took a break for a while and didn't play the game and came back to new cards, I, I think I could pilot a new deck fairly well, fairly quickly. People would always mention the term burnout to me. Burnout, burnout, burnout. I, I didn't know what it was. I would constantly play Hearthstone all the time. I definitely want to have more titles and put my name in, in Hearthstone, in Hearthstone history. Hello, my name is Kong Shu. Uh, my handle is Strife Crow. I think my original name uh, was just like Strife. I think I just stole it from someone else that I saw online at the time when I was like 10. Uh, one of my favorite esports memory, uh, it was like a dream hack. I ended up having like this like epic, like I don't even know how long this game against Glento eventually beat me in that game, but I kind of brought the mage to the tournament, not as like, say I thought it was like the best thing ever, but because I I just wanted to like show people I could destroy everyone with my with my kind of like troll deck. The thing I'm most looking forward to in Grand Masters is kind of the uh, the dynamic, because I've never really had this like league kind of dynamic in the past. You have two matchups a week, and you can kind of like target them. You know, you can start making spreadsheets, see what they play, see what decks are good against the decks that they play. You can even kind of play some mind games like that. I think my play is unique in the sense that um, I'm very like technical. I 
don't play a lot on intuition as much. Like I really like to have my you know, thoughts and game plans planned out and, and go from there. Uh, my personal goals this year is kind of to get back into Hearthstone. Because I took such a long break, I feel like I'm finally refreshed and ready to go. So that's one thing I'm just looking forward to get like that motivation back. Welcome back to the Tavern. I'm that's Admiral, and I'm joined by Saddle, and you're watching Hearthstone Grandmasters for the European region. We got two matches left before the regular season is concluded. And right now, we're amidst Boston taking on Silver Name, battling it out for some pride and surprise. Yep, and the good news is that Admirable has calmed down just a little bit um, as we we took that break. Um, but I think he's he was he was justified in his criticism. It was um, kind of unbecoming play from a grandmaster, I believe, towards the end of that game. Oh yeah, it was it was just strange. Um, either way, it's foregone conclusion. He had the freezes to back it up. Yep. So he had the liberty to take it slow if he really wanted to. But we're now changing up some decks. They have secondaries uh, and tertiaries that matter in this situation. For Boston, he's moved over to add in a Frostbolt, two Halftime Scavengers, and a Ravel Bouncer in place of a Stargazer Luna, a Sandbinder, the Twilight Drake, and an Archmage Antonitis. And yeah, I love the Frostbolt coming in. The Halftime Scavengers have definitely performed uh, very well for the players that have um, brought them in. Uh, significantly better than they've tended to perform for me when I've tried them out, um, which is interesting. I've definitely picked up a thing or two in terms of um, mulligans and just play cadences in terms of how, how to make them the most effective. Um, but Rabble Bouncer is a card that we've debated, not a card personally that I am a huge fan of. Not a huge fan of it, just a fan of it. Oh, let's take a look at Silvername and what he's brought in. It's the standard package that we've come to know and love from Rogue. Single Betrayal, two Fairy Dragons, and two Walk the Planks. Generate tempo, get more tempo, blow up their thing, and secure tempo. Yeah, uh, you call it standard. There has been one or two minor diversions where we saw, I think, RDU bringing just one Fairy Dragon, and there is uh, one player whose name escapes me right now who is bringing kind of the reverse in the removal package. They're playing two Betrayal, one Walk the Plank. Um, this is the configuration that makes the most sense to me. I've uh, definitely become more of a believer in this makeup of the deck over time. Uh, at first, it seemed bizarre to me that the more aggressive deck was pulling in answers instead of more aggressive options. Um, but given further testing and further examination of just you know how the rhythm of the matchup works, it starts to make a lot of sense to yeah, me. Yeah, the the answers are more of a, of a follow up yep. than it is um, a responsive thing. Like you don't hold on to walk the plank and hope that you can walk the plank a giant. You mulligan for minions, play minions, and then hope that sometimes you have a walk the plank to blow up a giant when they have to plop it. Right. That often, just the fear of that alone, keeps your opponent from playing the giant. Why is that just your go-to phrase? Plop it? Plop it. Well, you just... Picture, like, turn six Azure Drake, right? Yeah. You're not happy with it. You're floating a mana, but you're drawing a card, and it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Plop it. Okay. It's just it, That's the only thing to do. You look at the rest of your cards, you go, what else am I going to do with this hand? Hmm. Right. I guess I picture like physical cards and you just kind of pull it in your hand like you just drop it on the table. <laughs> Fairy Dragon found from Silvername. But the most important card in his mulligan is that shiny little circular number on the far right. Interesting. Do you have a follow-up? <laughs> okay, no. So uh, well, I'm, th I, well, I'm thinking through a lot of things, and one of the things I'm thinking about, I was I was pulling a saddle here. Where I, I have, my brain has to process everything before I make a stupid statement. Okay. Um, the draws that are good for Silver Name in this spot look like backstab, shadow step, and that's really the only things I think that he'd pay off to Edwin Van Cleef. Um, with the Edwin Van Cleef here, I think that you just never point the Fairy Dragon. Is sort of what I'm getting at. Oh, okay, sure. Like if you had a second Fairy Dragon, oh my uh, gosh. And you see the exact same reaction from Silver Name, but in Russian. <laughs> so now backstab is the prime drop. It's not there, so I think Waggle Pick comes to mind. Can I just protect this Fairy Dragon? Just keep on trucking. Yes, absolutely. The other way to protect it, though, is Eviscerate, which I quite like. That's what I was looking at straight away. 
Yeah, this is just more development. Yep. Okay. Yeah, my idea was silly. Yeah, it just nets more damage on the following turn this way. You throw away four damage essentially either way, be that a waggle pick charge or an eviscerate, but this develops a whole entire fairy dragon in the process. And look at the difference the coin makes. Boston uh, has five cost giants in hand. Yep. And that means this turn is nothing. I guess you could mirror image and load it up with two bananas. Yay. Hooray. Cool. Mm. That Ravel Bouncer not coming down this turn also means that by the time it comes down, Silver Name's going to have option for Sap and then Thing behind it. Mm. Yeah, this is looking rough for, uh, for old Elias Sibelius here. No, no, no. He's, he's Boston when he loses. Elias Sibelius is the name of a winner. Okay. <laughs> Why is it that, lost? That, that, that guy doesn't lose. I won. Listen to that name. Your fondness of the name makes me more fond of it. It's so good. Why don't you love it as much as I do? I just said that you that it makes me like okay. it more. Yeah. All right. Come on. I don't okay. like things very often. Backstab here, I think, is also important because it lets you preload the Edwin Van Cleef. And that means that you have Sap and Edwin and Vendetta and Waggle Pick to push through threats. Like, Boston is just actually about to get completely tempoed out. So many options. You can definitely see it. So if he, well, Backstab Ed wins this turn, he pushes an additional three. He's representing 10 more on the board the next turn. That's two turns from effective that Effective 14 with a waggle pick to back that up, which puts him at effective six. So yeah, one more min one more turn of the minions surviving after that, and Boston is mm. just cooked. And Silvername has Sap to back that up to push through as well. Silvername goes waggle pick instead, though. Yeah, I'm okay with preloading the waggle pick as well and, and just, like, smashing, because what ends up happening here is when uh, Boston's going to develop more here, you now have the option to uh, bring back Fairy Dragon, which will cost free, and then you also have Backstab, you also have Sap, you also have Edwin. Like, you just get to load a bigger Edwin this way. Keeps a lot of tension on Rabble Bouncer, so that if you see, like, Rabble Bouncer, Ray of Frost, hmm. that's not an issue. Sure. Push one additional damage this turn, just in terms of the damage clock. You miss out on there being a 4-4 four -four on the board, but it comes down as a 6-6 six -six or bigger on a later turn. Catches up in that race pretty quickly. Yeah. And since we're talking about a two-turn race after that point anyway, that 6-6 six -six does I have the ability wonder. to make up for lost damage. Yeah, it seems fine. You see why Halftime Scavenger is such an important Oh, yeah, match. absolutely. Oh, absolutely. What to do? What to do? Unity. Precision. Perfection. The EXAM on curve is usually something that you definitely don't want to see when you've just drawn the double fairy dragon nuts and you're just pushing for damage, but Silver Name has perhaps his best possible turn, really, against a Zilliax. It's like he's holding back again on the Edwin, though. Yeah, I mean, flexibility is important, too. I feel like aggression's important as well, though. It's scary to give time to mage. Agreed. Starting to get to that point in the game where the mage's hand just kind of fixes itself, where even if they haven't been able to get the huge hand size and get those giants down super cheap, as they start to approach seven, turn seven, eight, and nine, these giants just start to fit in with just about everything. If you don't have significant pressure on them by that time, Find yourself getting blown past and blown out of the game. What to do? What to do? I think Boston has been very much missing uh, 
Ray of Frost this turn. I think Ray of Frost this turn and then several turns after now. Now that there is a Blink Fox down in play that can actually be targeted and likely to be an Edwin in the near future as well. Ray of Frost would have made so many of these turns so much more simple. I think Boston not playing the Mirror Image here is uh, directly consideration for Sap. If you get Sapped, you have Mountain Giant Conjurer's Calling. Giant in hand currently costs six. It will go down to five with the Sap, go down to four off the card draw. Boston Conjurer's Calling for seven. Yep, chips out. The Brotherhood Shell Company. There it is. Boston just trying to process reads right now. The giant was killed, um, you know, straight up with damage. Do. The old fashioned way, there was no walk the plank, there was no sap being used on it. What does that mean? Does he eliminate those cards from Silvername's hand? I don't think you necessarily can. Obviously, we see the reality is that Silvername does have Sap, but I think when you have those answers in your deck, if you can afford to kill a giant with damage, you can hold mm. on to the emergency answer for an emergency, for a desperate situation. Yeah. Also, just the Edwin here, uh, I think, somewhat further complicates that, where you get a little bit less of a read as to the remaining cards, because your opponent, I think, oh, clearly have prioritized on. playing a Miscreant and an Edwin in the same turn. Sure. I wonder. You know, to me, uh, the fact that the turn was played in haste would be uh, a more accurate situation to rely on than anything else. What does it look like when I walk the plank versus what does it look like when I play the Edwin? I just think that, he, that Boston's running out of options. Austin, I think tells you about about the rest of this game. Silvername thinking about exactly uh, Sea Giant Ravel Bouncer stuff. In both cases, he's not able to really impact that unless he wants to blow up his own thing. I th no, I wouldn't even change that. Either way, there's going to be a Sea Giant Frost new available. No liberty to play around it. Means play your stuff. Arena's full. Beat it. and just going fishing. Ooh. Very little defensive ability found. He's okay. already facing down minimum 12, 13 that he can see the next turn. I mean, has Ray of Frost, and this is uh, a counter punch for 13. Mm. So, you know, like one way to defend yourself might be enough here. The fear, of course, is still removal and sap. Boston does not stop any of the damage on the opposing side. He is dead. Hmm. Time runs out on me. I just want to value trade over this fairy dragon. It's kind of irritating. I don't like this fairy dragon. Boston just goes with the ping, holds onto the bananas in hand. Ten damage available. Yeah, plus whatever comes out of the miscreant, which is not going to add up to seventeen. Hmm. Seven nine and left buffed by Storm and Champion. Recently added. Battle cry. Return to play all minions you control that died this turn. All friendly minions. There we go. So many options. Boston bracing for impact. Oh, 
to no good. I'll you soon. That's good. Sap the big dumb thing. interested in hanging on to the damage from hand. Yeah, this makes sense. Just use the Rush Lackey, which is far less consistent damage, especially when you don't have a Leroy in hand, and just hold on to the four from hand with Cobalt Lackey. Makes sense. That's pretty close to wrapping things. I'm thinking we need Arcane Intellect from this magic trick, and then I'm thinking you need a, a world of wonderful things to happen. Boston just read the new card, just to be sure, and then went, nope, okay, it's a magic trick. <laughs> It's not even like disaster for opponent minion conjurers what calling to potential. Do. What to do? You can't shoot at the fairy dragon. Can we just the two drop? Slow and clunky. Yep. Everything got checked. Rogue's good at that. I think the key term for Silver Name, though, is deciding not to sap that initial giant and just going through it with damage. And as you say, generating the big Edwin turn on top of it. That left him have um, it's le that let him have a position where the sap was just the game-ending card in the spot that he got himself into because it was just way too much tempo in a position where, as you said, Boston actually made a pretty effective counter punch with the, uh, the Rebel Bouncer and the Conjurer's Calling. Silver Name held on to his best cards for emergency, kept himself ahead enough during the mid-game period, and was able to blow out the, the game with the yeah. good card, the sap. To me, the just the the whole painful part was watching him contemplate Coin Fairy Dragon and, and thinking, if I draw second Fairy Dragon, this is really good, and then immediately draw second Fairy Dragon after yeah. not coining it. So, I mean, that that's like the things you have to think about when you're playing the aggressive decks, though, is just what are my ideal draws? How does each draw impact things? Uh, what does now mean versus later? We saw that directly come up in Orange's matchup earlier. Uh, what does now mean versus later? And it, it means a lot sometimes. It doesn't always mean that, but you know you should take your time to think about it because I think those situations are more complicated than they look on, on the onset. Yeah, I think that's definitely a good point to bring up. I think the perception is that, you know, playing aggressively and just dealing damage is the easier way to play Hearthstone. You know, like, oh, me go face, SM Orc, etc. It's But there's a lot of calculation that goes into that that's hidden. It's not as overtly complicated as, for example, when someone's playing a ridiculous Cyclone Mage turn and there's 25 different actions they have to get through in the turn and various probabilities of outcomes from Conjurer's Calling and blah, 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 blah. Um, but there's still that same thing going on behind the scenes. It's just kind of diluted down into a more uh, simple-looking execution. Yeah, and, and I definitely want to also and, and cap that point off with the fact that your decisions in the, those aggressive points often carry much more weight where a single misstep there means that sometimes you can't kill an important minion, and that causes you to lose the game. <laughs> yep. Yeah, Face Hunter, way back when, like original Face Hunter, was one of the most powerful decks in the game for a long time. But at the highest level, if you did one single thing wrong over your six or seven turns of Face Hunter that um, uh, constituted a whole game, y you just lost. There was no way you won. Long time ago, heading into uh, to Fight Night. Is this a Chucky story? Oh, it's a Chucky yeah. story. <laughs> Uh, we had settled on the fact that everyone in our group was going to play Face Hunter. It just, it was the best deck. We knew it was. It had so much damage efficiency. And we were practicing getting that deck down to just like one turn sooner. One turn sooner was like the whole point of that deck was all of the decks could be quite fast. You had very limited defensive potential that time. You know, we played like Earthen Ring Farseer and Mark of the Wild to try and protect ourselves. And I looked down at my hand. I started laughing to Chalky, and I said, I don't think I'm going to have time for this later. And turn one, I arcane shot him in the face. And he just started laughing. And he said, it honestly doesn't seem that bad. And then at the end of the game, I had used perfect mana in every card and dealt the last point of damage. And when we found that out, every single turn we're looking at, we're like, how can we spend more mana this turn? Just one more mana. What to do? What every to decision do? point mattered, because I would have died the next turn. Osden finds himself on coin in the Breaker in the series, and he also finds himself with a much smoother looking hand as well. And those two things are somewhat connected. A lot of hands look much smoother when they have the coin in them at the start of the game for Mage, um, but the Banana Buffoon and the Arcane Intellect are definitely helping out more so as well. Quite interested in this Vexcrow pickup. 
that seems like it could be very problematic for Boston. You know, the nature of it is generate tempo and blow up their things. Now you're generating tempo as you blow up their things. Yeah. I wonder. You can see it. Silver Name doesn't have that much cheap stuff to go along with the Vexcrow. Obviously, like, Vexcrow is a card that we see sometimes uh, in this mage deck that Boston is playing. Uh, we've seen it in a copy, couple of the additional decks that players have brought in the early weeks of Grandmasters, and we see it occasionally on Ladder as well. Um, but if you look at the comparison of the two decks, we're used to Rogue just being the cheap spell class. They have the most cheap spells. Um, since they've dropped preparation, I think Mage actually has them beat these days in terms of just cheap stuff that they can do. Yeah, I'm thinking just in terms of how the matchup wants to pan out. I think Vexcrow here is quite threatening for, uh, for Boston. I think the Hedge Clan Burglar is probably just a better card in general. Yeah. Okay. Um, I it feels like Luna's is just the only option. Right. Vexcrow is almost certainly a beast, right? It is a beast. Yeah. But six mana summon that and give it rush doesn't really seem particularly effective. So many. Options. I could pay just two more for my <laughs> Vexcrow while using a card to do it. Yep. I don't know. It's one of those scenarios where you just pick the card that has the greatest percentage chance of actually getting played this game, but the percentage of all three of those is barely above one. Yeah. I'm much more interested in a 3-3 three, three next turn than I am in a Lotus mm. Pocket Galaxy. Agreed. The minions in my deck are already very cost efficient. Yep. And so for Boston, it is about setting up this Conjurer's Calling turn, which is as early as next turn if he wants to display a lone card on this one. I wonder. What is the card that's somewhat obscured on the far left? Is there a card there? No, there isn't. I'm making it up. Don't no, worry. there's a card on the far left that's obscured. Oh, it runs out on me. It looks like it. Is there not? Yeah, yeah the rabble bouncer. bouncer. Okay. I wonder. There he is. Interesting turn. One banana and then spend a card afterwards just so he maintains that, that maximum hand size for the uh, the country's calling on the following turn. Ah! Yep. That's bad news. <laughs> That's bad news. That is also bad news. That's the worst one. All right. He kind of wanted that Frostbolt. Yeah, but Boston's going to become Elias of Elias this turn, or at least try <laughs> to, because there's a lot of pressure on the other side. Like, Silverdame can actually eliminate both of these. <laughs> Boston with the with the prayer hands real quick. Yep. He's going to get some really oh. bad news. That is the maximum bad. Yeah, all right, you were right. This Vex card is going to be sick. Unless it's just more Ancient Watchers. You win this round. That one's not super good. That's fine. It's a free minion. It's a free minion. It's still good. It's still good. It's a bit better. Silvername now thinking about Sea Giant stuff. Rabble Bouncer stuff. That Ancient Watcher, honestly, is just abysmally bad. I Anything know. else yep. could attack except for a 0-4. Yep. It's not even zero. It's actively bad. That is an active negative thing for Silver Name to have gotten from the so That means uh, he just gives up on it. He's like, yeah, yeah a lot of help you were. I think there is some merit here to, to expending the help, but... Yeah, I don't think I want this 2-1 on the board. Yeah, I kind of want board space. Yep. Like, we lost a slot on the board. I want board space. I want my opponent's Rabble Bouncer to be more expensive. I want my opponent's Sea Giant to be more expensive. Especially when I have just one less board slot to play for the rest of the game. It is in the middle, though. Constant reminder. <laughs> Arena's full. Beat it. Out again. 
going to respect the damage coming through. Mirror Image, the best defense you can put up now. I guess Ray of Frost on the 4-3. Not the worst thing. Austin's not happy about this. I mean, if you're going to put seven drops in your deck and Conjure has called them, this is going to happen to you. Yeah. There is an enormous level of variance with that, seven drops. That, the thing for me is I kind of expect this to happen sometimes. You yeah. know? I, I'm looking for opportunities to try and take advantage of this kind of stuff. Yeah. And I think this was the turn for him to do it. I just don't think the outcome is very good. At the same time, Silvername literally got a nothing in play. <laughs> It has felt like one of those series where both players will come out of it feeling like they were enormously unlucky, and, just like based on the reactions from the two players. And I, and I have said this a lot about, you know, I think Boston situations. I think he has often gotten into some, into some pretty unlucky situations overall. Use libs. Luna's Pocket Galaxy Wondrous Wand. The best combo. <laughs> <laughs> All right, how can you counter push with this ooze? I'm thinking step one is probably Frost Nova. I'm sorry, Magic Trick, and, and take a take a look at what's happened. Because what I'm seeing is Magic Trick mm. leaves you with three uh, six mana left, three that can go to Frost Nova, and that would mean you can banana the underbelly ooze and hero power it. You get to connect for four, and then you have eight damage in play. So depending all on right. what you get from the magic trick, I think there is a counter push opportunity here. All right. I like all of those words. Shooting star can hit your own underbelly ooze. Plural. On, so, the, on the following turn, if you've gone down the banana frost over, frost over that, So that's the thing. Then you say, Ooh. let's let's say then you hero power your own ooze and shooting star, and then you have... Two, we have four three threes in play. You get to connect for three, and you frost nova on the previous turn. So then you have twelve attack loaded with what's happening in that spot. So I think he's free to instead use it with the cyclone and end up doing some trading here. He has to start respecting damage. He knows the tog's going to load up and be powerful. But I feel like this left him with little counter push opportunity. And sap, I believe, is just lethal. Yep. Sap, 3-3 three, three kills, 0-2, 6 wow. on board, 6 in hand, 6 plus 6 is 12, 1 plus 1 is 2, and that means Silvername is going to take this series 2 games to 1 over Boston. Throws out the well played, and Silvername has gone a long, long way um, to restore some esteem, some respect to his name after going to a very, very poor start early on uh, with some questionable deck choices that we did question extensively. He switched back to uh, Warrior and Rogue in the most recent weeks and has shown that when playing those decks, he can put up as good a record as anyone. Yep, and I think this is a very respectable finish for Silvername given what he brought in the middle of the season. Um, I want to see more of that in Season 2. I want to see the good stuff, and I want to see him beating people up because I know he has what it takes. I've seen him play a lot. It's interesting because, you know, as mentioned before, he did really believe in those decks that he brought. You know, he did say when asked, if, I think these are the best decks to bring. I think they give me the highest chance. I think my opponents are just high rolling against me. It's kind of the stance that he got. And he wasn't wrong in certain places. He did come up against some very powerful hands. Um, but it's interesting just seeing, you know, player who personally, like, I haven't really connected with the scene, you know, the 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 Russian scene, that kind of area. It's a different language. It doesn't really interact with the rest of Europe or Americas too often. Their kind of um, CIS region is kind of insular in a lot of ways. Sometimes those places just have different ideas on what good decks are, and it takes a while for them to um, come around, if they do, to the rest of the world's world, uh, way of thinking. Indeed. And so we can take a look at the standings now and see where things shape up, uh, kind of touching on that language thing. Uh, neither of us know Russian. So we unfortunately cannot interview Silvername Duh. in that regard. Five and nine record overall for uh, for Silvername moves up to the furious Etten record <laughs> of the five and nine stat line to join Boston and Boar Control at that level. And those are the three players at the top that are advancing to next week's playoffs.